Today on Food for Thought, I have Dr. Caroline Wheeler with me, who's an integrative medical doctor working previously in New Zealand, and she's come back to the UK to help people to sleep better with her program called Storytime. Hi, Caroline. How are you today? Hi, Deborah. Now, from my clinical experience with my practice, sleep has become a casualty of modern living, and it's seen as getting in the way of doing everything else everything is more interesting i particularly notice it with the kids that i see uh, but it's having hugely detrimental effects isn't it absolutely and a lot of sleep specialists are saying that we as a society need a wake-up call about the importance of sleep and and the work that i do with people so many people tell me that they're busy they wake up early or they go to bed late and the number one thing that we need to remember is that when we sleep well, everything else happens happens more easily in our lives. Really fascinating. And, you know, our brains never really sleep, do they? That's the thing. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, it's you, you know, it's, sleep is still quite a mystery. We know a lot of what happens in sleep, but there's still a lot that we don't know. But the more you look into what happens to our bodies and to our mind when we sleep, the more... The more you value sleep and the more intriguing it is. So our, our brains basically, you know, well, the research around the brain that I've just been reading most recently is saying that the cerebral um, spinal fluid come, is coming into the brain only at night. And therefore that's because the brain has no lymphatic system. That's the way of actually clearing out the actual waste from the brain, which is actually a highly intensive unit in, in our organ, in our, in our uh, body. So in effect, if we don't go into that sleep state, we're not able to clear the waste out from our brain, is, is what I'm understanding from the recent research. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. I've not heard that, but that sounds really interesting. It's really fascinating. Now, you know, there's a pioneer of sleep research at um, University of Chicago called Alan Reichenschaffen, and he basically has a cracking quote that I love, Caroline, and it's, if sleep does not serve an absolute vital function, then it's the biggest mistake that evolutionary process ever made. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But we all know how much better we feel when we sleep well. Yes. Sleep well, we have better memory. Everything works better in our lives. But um, it was very interesting. I actually interviewed someone recently who, who's, who studied biochemistry at um, Oxford University. And then he went into marketing. And when his daughter was 22 years old, she, she was diagnosed with a grade 4 brain tumour. And so he went back to biochemistry and studied everything he could find um, about cancer. And he's written an amazing book called Everything You Need to Know About Cancer. And he talks about the absolute essential importance of sleep and how in sleep we have the most powerful antioxidant that our body produces called melatonin. That's produced when we sleep. And when we don't get enough sleep, we don't get the healing that we need. And so if you look at athletes, for example, when they're going through intense training, they have a lot more deep sleep. And one of the things that I'm fascinated by is how can we have deeper sleep in our life? What can we do in order to have better quality and quantity of sleep or optimal quality, quantity of sleep and deeper sleep? And as a meditator myself, and I'm into yoga as well. I'm fascinated by how I feel. I like to feel at my peak, like these athletes. So athletes are very conscious of their bodies and what they need to do. So they're very conscious about what they eat, and they're very aware of their sleep and their depth of sleep. And for me, too, when I was doing my general practice, you know, I was having to number crunch. I was having to see somebody in New Zealand. We'd saw somebody every 15 minutes, but they'd have a list of about three or four things. So would have to be on the ball and when I slept well and when I ate well I just noticed my brain was so much more efficient than when I didn't sleep well of course so my study over the last many years has been what do I need to do in order to have that quality of sleep and stress is cited as one of the main reasons 
but particularly in my practice, that people are not getting a, a good night's sleep. They can't quiet their mind down. Uh, they're constantly worrying before they go to bed and then it just keeps them awake. What are your suggestions to help resolve that? Yeah, well, it's, it's all about balance. So life to me is all about balance. How do we find balance in our life? And so many people rush through the, through their day. They get up in the morning, they jump out of bed, they don't sit and have time for contemplation or meditation. They just get out of bed and get on with their day. And they do that throughout their day and then through their evening as well. And, and what I'm fascinated by is studying people who do things well. So as a GP, I was fascinated at what people did when they healed and when they were healthy and, and in sleep. What is it that people do who sleep well? And specifically, what, it is, what is it that you do yourself when you sleep well? So, so people who sleep well tend to have a much more balanced life. So they eat well. They have some exercise during the day so that they're physically tired as well as mentally tired when they go to bed. And this is really important. It's what people choose to do in their evenings before bed that makes the most impact on the quality of sleep. So... I'm a real advocate of what I call a, a pre-bedtime relaxation routine. And that's chilling out. That's what, we, that's what I, as a child, was taught. And that's what we should be teaching our children. But so many people, so many adults, are now using TV as, as, as the babysitter. So TV, of course, affects the way we sleep and affects the way our children sleep. So having that pre-bedtime relaxation routine. And then I've created something called story time, which is really about anchoring us back to the, that childhood routine that we were taught because it's all about routine. It's all about rhythms in our life. So if we get back to that routine of relaxing before bed and having an evening meal, a lighter evening meal, several hours before bed and maybe a bath several hours before bed, and then we relax and we go to bed and try and still our mind. Because when you actually understand, Deborah, a little bit of the science of sleep, what is it that happens to us when we do sleep? What's happening to our body and what's happening to our mind? So if you look at the brainwave pattern of sleep and the brainwave pattern of normal waking consciousness, the brainwaves are much faster during the daytime. And in order to go into that deep sleep, we need to go into that much slower brainwave pattern. And so it makes sense to have a, a slower transition and not like jump into bed and expect ourselves to be able to go to sleep. So I remember when I used to do 12-hour shifts um, in my general practice and then I'd go to an evening meeting and I'd be exhausted and I'd throw myself into bed at night and then I just couldn't sleep. And I wondered why. And yet, when I, after a while, I, I soon got it that... Every night when I slept well, I'd always have that pre-bedtime relaxation routine. I'd chill out and slow my mind down before bed. So what would be the latest time you would eat, for instance, in that pre-routine? Because I, you know, I, I will see clients and they are still eating at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So, so, so give me an understanding of what that pre-routine would more specifically look like for people. Okay, wonderful. So... So, for example, let, let's take myself. So I come back from work at, at 6 o'clock and I might, in New Zealand, I might go for a walk on the beach with my dog um, and I might then have an evening meal about 7 o'clock and I wouldn't eat any later than that. And I'd have quite a light meal. I wouldn't have my main meal of the day at night because I wouldn't want to go to bed with a heavy stomach. And then... I would chill out. I might have a bath a couple of hours before bed. And then for me, I'd tend to go to bed about 10 o'clock. And then I might, I might read a book or I might listen to what I've created, um, which is story time. And I tended to listen to that when I was going through a stressful period, like I lost my house in the floods, for example, and my, my mind would be busy worrying about things. And so to actually focus my mind on something calming instead of allowing it to focus on worry. So you're basically shifting that whole focus away, aren't you? Most people will, when they get into a cycle, I find, of not being able to sleep, that is what they then focus on, not being able to sleep. How do you get 
how do you change that focus for them? How do you help them shift that? Yeah, well, that's a really quick, good question because so many people I see have a negative association with bed and sleep. So they get into bed and they immediately it's anchored into them that they wake up. And, and yet when they go to someone else's house, they often go to bed and they go to sleep. But their own bed, they've tossed and turned so many nights in bed that, that they just can't sleep because they get into bed and they think, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to sleep again. And they get into this vicious cycle of not being able to sleep. And actually what's interesting, Deborah, is when you understand the science of that, when you understand what's happening when you get worried and you get anxious, you produce adrenaline. Adrenaline causes the blood to go to the heart and away from the peripheries because you, you want to, the, the, the muscles in the heart because you want to have to run from the tiger. And that means that your feet and your hands get cold, even though you might not realize it, they're, they're getting cold, and you can't drop your core body temperature. So in order to sleep, we need to drop our core body temperature. And when you've got too much adrenaline in your system, you can't do that. So it's actually impossible to sleep when you're too anxious. So, so you've got to find a way of bringing the adrenaline in your system down. You've got to find a way of calming your body and your mind in order to sleep. Physiologically, it's impossible to sleep if you're too worried. Now, traditionally in sleep clinics, what they do is they do this thing called bed restriction. If you're, in, if, if you're too worried and you're lying in bed, not able to sleep for about 20 minutes, they get you to get up. But, you know, from, from my perspective, we progressed from that, that place. And sometimes you need to do that if you're too worried. You need to get up and, and go and have a wander around the house or try and calm yourself down or do some stretches or, or whatever. But for me, there's so many other ways of doing it. There's so many tricks that you can do. And I've, I've created, um, I take some people through something called a sleep kit. And I've created NLP, neuro linguistic programming, exercises to reassociate bed with relaxation and calm. But there's so many things that people can do. And one thing is that they can redesign their bedroom. They can maybe put a new, um, a new duvet on the bed or they can clean out the bedroom, clean all the junk from the bedroom to, to set that intention of bed being sleep. And then, of course, there's all the things that people do when they can't sleep. They take their computer and they, they take a TV into the bedroom so that when they're bored, they have something to do, which just makes everything so much worse. What's your opinion on these devices now in regards to the impact they're having on sleep? Oh, it's, it's, it's huge, Deborah. I mean, like, I saw one woman the other day, and what she, what she, she started off with a medical problem and she couldn't sleep. And so when she got bored, she'd get out a computer and watch YouTube. And YouTube is a perfect way to stay awake because not only do you stimulate your mind, but you also upset your melatonin cycle because of the light from your device, from the light from your tablet, the light from your computer, the light from your TV. It upsets your melatonin cycle. So it's crazy. And, and it's such a discipline for people to get out of that. And even myself, I got into the habit of, of using my computer checking my emails, watching YouTube, whatever I was doing. And I had to discipline myself to leave my cell phone, to leave my computer out of my bedroom and see that pre-bedtime um, relaxation as essential. To see that time of slowing down my mind as more of a spiritual process, rather like a meditation. So, you know, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't be... be um, Look at looking at my computer or my cell phone while I'm meditating or I'm doing yoga and the same thing when I go to bed. I'm wanting to calm and slow down my brainwave patterns and watching YouTube is going to speed it up or checking my emails is going to speed it up. The thing is, is there's so many people now not only have, well, let's talk about children because I know that televisions have got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and most people are now putting them in their children's rooms. On top of that, they have the small devices. Um, it's 
it, it's actually a, a huge disaster for children's not only their behaviour but actually their their long term health, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There was when we were talking before you quoted a study um, from the Pediatric Journal, American Pediatric Journal, and they took what's it? They took 1,864 kids, and they said 17% of those children had a TV in their bedroom at four years old. Seven years old, it went up to 23% had a TV in their bedroom. And you know, so, but one of the things that really concerns me is it, are all the illnesses, are all the diseases of modern day. Like cancer is just got out of, got out of control. And, and we have to go back to basics. And sleep is a basic. And it's, it's, a, it's an inexpensive basic, isn't it? Absolutely, it's crazy. Like, why do people spend so much money on insurance policies? Because that's bottom of the cliff medicine. Okay, it's reassuring to have that. But why not take a little bit of time to get the fundamental things right? The fundamental things of good nutrition, basic exercise, and sleep. And if we get that right we're so much more likely to stay healthy. Now, you, you, you mentioned the, the sleeping environment. You were talking about the sleeping environment and um, the things that we need to be looking at and, and that whole uh, leading in. But what about the, the temperature in your room? Because, you know, you said that the body needs a drop in temperature to actually be able to sleep effectively. So, so in effect, some... <laughs> We could be in an environment where we're overheating ourselves, couldn't we, as well? That could be another factor for why we may not be sleeping. Mm, mm, absolutely. The thing is, there's so many different factors. Sleep is such a big topic. However, when we keep it simple, um, and our body will tell us, when we listen to our body, we're too hot at night or we're too cold at night. So, for example, let me give, an, give you one example. I, my, when I came back to England... Uh, my mother wasn't sleeping very well. And I found out she wasn't sleeping very well because she had cold feet. And so all I did was I filled up a hot water bottle and said to her, look, take this to bed, make sure your feet are warm. And I gave her some little bed socks. And she started sleeping so much better because her feet weren't cold. And then when she slept better, she started healing better. And she cut herself. She had a fight with the rose bush in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> and she went to the nurse, and the nurse said, wow, you're healing so much faster. What's happened? And really, it was all about the fact that, well, it was also nutrition as well. She was eating better because I was cooking, but also she was sleeping so much better. So something so simple as a hot water bottle can make such a difference. And, and once you understand that in order to sleep, you need to drop your core body temperature by three degrees Fahrenheit, which is about one and a half degrees centigrade. Now, that's a lot. And the only way your body can lose that heat is through your hands and feet. And if your feet are too cold, it just can't, it can't lose that extra heat. And you know that, you know, you'll, you'll have maybe yourself or somebody else, you'll know that when somebody's too hot, they put their feet out from under the bedclothes because they're trying to lose that extra heat from their body. And, and so, so many, there's so many other things about this. So like you, you mustn't go to the gym or exercise just before you go to bed because you heat up and it takes you longer to drop your core body temperature. And in, for example, in the middle of the winter, if your room is too cold, especially in those early hours, then you're too cold and you can't sleep. You wake up and then you can't sleep again. So it's all about having the, like, a, like not too hot, not too cold, temperature of your room right not too light you want don't want it don't want it too light you want it dark in your bedroom and you want it comfortable and you want it peaceful like you know you know how you feel when you walk into a spa you feel so relaxed why not have your bedroom like that and we've completely turned that on its head it's almost like an extension of our living room for for so many particularly for children now <laughs> now um you know, what's on my mind there is obviously, you know, your quilt and your blankets are absolutely key because I assume it's not only whether they're the, the right tog, but also about how heavy they are on your body because surely that also will then keep you awake. Yeah, you know. All sorts of factors. 
Yeah, it was it was really interesting. You, you know what happens um, is I lost my house in the flood three years ago, and um, so then I didn't have a home. And I and like then I stayed with people, and then I rented someone. I came back to England, and I, and I. I started right from the beginning. It was fascinating because I was doing, I was working with sleep and I came back, the bed I slept in at my mother's when I stayed with her was so uncomfortable. So I had to throw the mattress away. I had to get a new bed. I had to, um, then the curtains weren't thick enough. I had to get thicker curtains. Every single thing about her guest room was wrong. So I couldn't sleep because it was too light. I couldn't sleep because it was too noisy. I couldn't sleep because the bed was so uncomfortable. And it was easy for me to dismiss that. I didn't want to cause any problems because there were, there were enough problems in her life as, as it was. But I couldn't. I went to stay with some friends and then I slept well and I came back and I said, no, I have to deal with these fundamental basic issues. And that's the same for everyone. It's these fundamental, basic things. Like a bedroom is for sleep. You know, what do they say? It's it's, um, for for rest, for relaxation, for sex and for sleep. That's all it is for. That's all a bedroom is for. And yet so many people use their bedroom as their office, use their bedroom as a storeroom. Clear your bedroom out. Make your bedroom into a soothing place to sleep. And make sure that that's the right temperature, make sure that it's dark enough because the light will wake you up. I was working with somebody the other day who was waking up at five o'clock and she said, I just can't understand it. I just can't sleep beyond five. And of course, dawn is five and it's because their curtains weren't thick enough. And what a difference it made to her life just to get some blinds as well as the curtains so that her room was dark enough so she could sleep that extra hour. I was interviewing Margaret Cahill a few months back and she was talking about the way the hospitals, um, she'd managed to influence the, the hospital that she'd stayed in to stop the, um, the nurses waking them up throughout the night um, because um, she found that she felt awful in the morning and many of them were feeling really quite ill in the mornings and that they realised that between, I think it was the time of 4.30, they were woken up five times. So they weren't getting a full night's sleep. Um, crazy. It is crazy. And also hospitals, um, in many respects, they're not getting the, the, the they've not understood the, the healing cycle that, that is so important, needs sleep and needs uninterrupted sleep and an environment that actually feels like you can sleep in because I see so many clients who've come out of hospital and that, they, they will say about the environment where they couldn't sleep at all and that people were coming and going. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and isn't it sad, Deborah, that our hospitals are the most unhealthy places imaginable? My father recently went to hospital and, and the, the guy next to him in the next door bed said that, that the ward was busier than the M25 at Russia between the hours of, of midnight and 4 a.m., you know, it was just so busy. Nobody could sleep. Crazy. And yet sleep is so important for healing. And I think that's where we've lost our way. We're sort of so into pharmacology. We're so into things that you can buy. And yet something that's free and is the most effective healing tool, we're not utilizing. If I could get into hospitals and change the face of hospitals, I would. The number of stories I hear, especially because of my parents and I'm talking to other friends whose parents have recently gone to hospital as well. The number of those parents who go into hospital and never come out, and and, and it's not a healing environment. The number of people also who, you know, arrive on on my clinic and they they will have bags and bags and bags of supplements and they'll empty them out. And the first things I will do are the simple things like get them to be hydrated, um, chew their food properly, take time, have that, you know, lead into food where, you know, you're talking about the lead into sleep. I'm talking about, you know, it's important to actually have the relaxation time before you eat so that actually that adrenaline isn't interfering with the digestive process. So it's the, it's these simple things that are free. Um, you should be considering really before actually taking all the supplements and medications. You need to get your hygiene around and your environment and the way you live your life, as you're saying, more balanced, don't you, prior to this? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, um, a prof, David Hillman, who's the chair of the Sleep Foundation, states, said sleep is a pillar of healthy living alongside good nutrition and exercise. And I would say relaxation of our body-mind as well. But like something so cool, so elementary, so cheap, and yet our NHS is crumbling. And it's crumbling because we're, we're looking for this magical cure in a pill. We're looking, or whether it be um, a pharma- pharmaceutical pill or whether it be a, a mineral or a supplement, we're looking for something outside of ourselves. Whereas we have the answers inside of ourselves, or a lot of the answers inside of ourselves, in something that's free. And, and, and this is what I found so fascinating, working with other people and also working with myself. How do I find that depth of sleep? And, and what is it that I need to do? And I found it absolutely fascinating, Deborah, this last while since I've been doing this, of how do I find this depth of sleep? And how do I slow down my mind enough? And what do I do when my mind is too busy? And there's so many things you can do. And yet, I mean, I I spent a whole year creating this sleep kit. And yet the one thing that I found was the the most effective thing that I found, I've I've taken out of it. And that's what I'm, I'm giving to people. And that's what I'm selling to people is this one story. It's how... How do we slow down our mind and stop listening to our busy, buzzing mind and listen to something outside of ourselves that can soothe us and take us into a slower brainwave pattern and take us into that depth of sleep? Now, how do you identify good sleep if you've never had it? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting that that's what people tell me initially. When I... When I spend a bit more time and ask them some more questions, most people that I work with, and remember that I work with many bad sleepers, or most of the people I work with are really bad sleepers when they come to see me, they've all experienced a night or a few nights or a few years of good sleep. They all know what good sleep is. I've never actually worked with somebody who's never had a good night's sleep, although at first they'll tell me that they haven't. They'll say, oh, I've never slept well. And then they'll say, well, actually I did. You know, when I went out into the country and I stayed with Auntie Auntie Bethel or Auntie Ethel or something, (laughs) I slept really well, you know, kind of. And then they start identifying the things that they need to do in order to sleep well. Can you make up for lack of sleep? Yeah, well, there's this thing called sleep debt. um, You can make up for for lack of sleep, although although we, we can cause ourselves a lot of damage from lack of sleep, but we can repay our sleep debt, sleep debt. And lots of teenagers who don't sleep well because of this delayed sleep dis- syndrome thing, so they have delayed 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 sleep phase disorder, and and they can go on holiday and make up that sleep debt and get back to a normal way again, even though they still have that delayed sleep phase disorder. So basically it doesn't have a cumulative effect over time, or would it with... So I suppose what I'm thinking is that if you are sleep-deprived for a long, long period of time, you have probably changed your circadian rhythms, therefore you will have changed your biological processes slightly, and therefore you're, you're inevitably going to you know, a bit like your mother, not be healing anywhere near as quickly or restoring your body anywhere near as effectively over that period of time. And it's not potentially the sleep that's having the cumulative effect at that point. It's actually the the overall effects that's had on the body physiologically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that's the whole thing as a practitioner. You know, somebody will come to me and their body will be in a total mess and they'll say, can I ever return to a healthy, normal situation and and you know you can you start wherever you are and whatever damage you've caused already hopefully if if you're that motivated enough you can you can repair to a certain degree do you think sleep deprivation is having an effect on the performance of children in schools oh completely absolutely there's there's so many studies to show that What's it? Something like 20% of children have um, 
don't, don't get the recommended amount of sleep. And 40% of children have poor sleep schedules. So, yes, absolutely, because sleep is essential for consolidation of memory. And, and there's a lot of studies uh, about, about napping in schools. And actually, I was talking oh. to a, mo- <laughs> um, uh, a mother of, of what, I can't remember the age, but of, of something like an 11-year-old child. And she was saying that at, at the schools, the private schools, were, because I'm from New Zealand, I, I don't know the schooling system so well now in England, but she said the private schools now in this area, in the south of England, are bringing in napping because of the value of napping to consolidation of memory. And um, I know that um, a, a young girl that I know, they have a nap every day at school and they all snuggle up with their pillows and they, they nap during school to teach them the value of napping. And, and napping is a fascinating topic. Talk to me about napping because you've got me completely hooked, Caroline. <laughs> well, so, so we're taught that, so, so for example, in, in, in old people's homes, a lot of old people tend to nap throughout the day and then they can't sleep at night. However, because they're sleeping too much during the day, they're not tired at night so they can't sleep. So that's not a good idea. However, one or two naps a day can be very useful if you're tired as an adult. So remember that my specialty is working with adults with sleep, not with children. So... If you're, if, you, if you're tired and you have a nap of about 20 minutes before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that doesn't usually affect your sleep at night, and it can be very valuable. Um, but what they're saying is that with children, what's the study? With children, if children nap during the day, then it can help with consolidation of memory. Um, so in infants who nap are better able to apply lessons learned to new skills, and preschoolers are better able to retain learned knowledge after napping. So I think that's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. It's saying more that we need to, you know, give give our children more downtime. I find that we're, and in work now, we're piling work in and we're putting more work onto people so they have no breaks in the day at all anymore. And what, what you're saying is that we actually need to take that space and time out to almost you know, switch but, off. Yeah, absolutely, Deborah. But one of the things that I think is fascinating is that napping is becoming more and more popular. Mm. So in terms of the workplace, so in Aussie, for example, they have napping pod stations and I was talking to this man the other day who was really interested in, I don't, I don't know much about soccer or football so I'm not really interested in it but he was saying that a lot of the football clubs now in England have, have, uh, have got uh, napping pods or sleep pods on the pitch and by, pe- by their players napping during the day they can have two training sessions a day as opposed to one and perform better And they apparently, I mean, I don't know anything about this really except for what this guy was telling me. Um, It started off because in Europe, I've just come back from walking the Camino in in Spain. And in Europe, in Barcelona, for example, Barcelona is is apparently a really successful club in terms of the, the soccer world. And they nap because it's part of their culture. And they find that that they they heal better. So, for example, like I said earlier, athletes who are training intensely have a lot more deep sleep. And so, because it's in that deep sleep that healing happens, it's in that deep sleep that our immune system happens and healing. For example, athletes, they need to heal the the torn muscles and they, they get a lot more deep sleep. So it makes sense for them to have naps during the day as well. That's very really fascinating. Yeah. I do know that uh, Manchester United, I think it was Rooney, and now I'm thinking of this off the, completely off the top of my head, but I think when Rooney had, um, had the, they had their children, that they started to manage his sleep. So they had, they, I think they took him either to a sleep centre or they had one set up at Manchester United and they were monitoring the sleep because they know how the impact of sleep has on the performance on the pitch. 
Oh, brilliant. <laughs> well, well, you know, Alex Ferguson is really fascinating in regards to how he is always on top of these things. I was talking to someone just recently about how he'd been working with some of their players um, doing uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, working with them on balance and things like this. And and so Ferguson seems to be very much, uh, has his fingers in these pies of of the alternative side as well as the, the cutting edge medical for his players. But then I suppose it's worth so much money to them. They, they make sure that the performance is absolutely there, no matter what. <laughs> but it's so interesting, isn't it? Because so often... Uh, these things happen in the business world or the sports world. And so, for example, a friend of mine um, used to be the charge nurse in, in Christchurch Hospital uh, of the, all the operating theatres, and she found that she had the skill of healing, and she started doing it with animals and, and, and then with people. And all the consultants started getting interested in this because she was this charge nurse. She was the head nurse. And, uh, and of course... The, the people who were most interested were the jockeys and the, and the top riders um, getting healing for their horses. And, and that's where it started for her. Yes. Yeah. I, I find that there's a lot of uh, celebrities, there's a lot of artists, um, there's a lot of actors and leading uh, business people using alternative approaches uh, or what would be considered alternative approaches um, to um, optimize their health. And um, they just don't tend to talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, it makes sense because people who are at the top of their game are wanting to have the, the best functioning body. They're wanting to have the best functioning mind. And so they're going to use whatever works. They're not going to use whatever anybody says. They're going to use whatever works. And so if it works to sleep well, they're going to prioritize their sleep. Hmm. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that I personally use, and I'm wondering whether you know about, it, is the earthing sheets, which you put across your bed. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. yes. I don't know much about them, but I've heard, obviously heard about them. Okay. I was going to ask you what your opinion was on them. I, um, I, I have to say, personally, um, from my own experience, I, I get far, far better quality sleep. No, noticed a very big difference in how I wake up in the morning. So that's, um, the, the earth inside of things was really fascinating. How interesting. Yeah, so now let's talk about weight issues and lack of sleep because um, lots of people come to me and they've got weight issues and they can't understand why one of the first things I'm working on is not only them chewing their food and relaxing but also getting them to sleep properly when they, when they think I should be working on their diet. Now talk to me about the correlation there so that people can understand why we are so focused on sleep and weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the... There's, there's an increasing number of studies that show an association between short sleep duration and and obesity, or, or basically metabolic problems, especially obesity and type 2 diabetes. And, and really, the reason is because of increased food consumption. So put simply, when you're tired, people tend to eat more. So, you know, I know that when I'm tired, so for example, when I get you know, when I used to be in, my, in general practice, I used to work night duty. Sometimes the only thing that would keep me awake in the middle of the night was eating something sweet or eating some carbs. And, and so, you know, I'd eat more than I needed to. So, so many people, I, I also have worked with people with weight. I, I did a program I, um, and I saw about 100 women mainly with weight problems. And sleep was a huge issue. When you don't get enough sleep, you're too tired and you keep yourself going with sugar or sugary drinks or caffeinated drinks or, you know, caffeine, like a coffee with some sugar. It, it's, it's a no-brainer. So for somebody who has a weight problem and wants to lose weight, the number one thing they need to look at first is their sleep or those four pillars that I was talking about, their sleep and the type of food that they're eating and some exercise. Do you think this could be a reason why the sugary cereals and all the sugary products um, that are available for mornings for breakfast have become so popular? Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. But I think we've just become, as a society, addicted to sugar. And so sugar sells. 
So these cereals sell because they're sweet, and if they if they weren't sweet, then people wouldn't buy them. But I suppose that's a factor. Now, one of the things that people are always shocked that I do, and I don't know if you find the same thing, Caroline, is that I pull the Coca Cola out of the diet, um, particularly that's being drunk in the evenings. Um, can you explain the impacts of Coke on sleeping? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I just think Coke should be banned. It's, <laughs> it's a great, um, yes, um, it's a great way of getting rust off your barbecue. So you just pour Coca-Cola onto it and it dissolves the rust off. Um, <laughs> why on earth would we drink something like that? But doesn't, uh, doesn't Coke have a spartamine in it as a sugar, um, I think it... it it has it has sugar there, so you've got ordinary Coke, you've got classic Coke, and then you've got your um, your zero Cokes. So I'm just talking about Cokes across the board, really, which have your caffeine levels, your sodium levels, as well as your sugar levels in them. Well, I'm you know I'm totally against all these rubbishy. It's just another rubbishy food. So first of all, sugar is a stimulant, and sugar and colorings and preservatives and all that sort of stuff can pe- can keep people awake and and also why would you put something like that into your body because it's as far as i'm concerned it's a poison so you know it makes sense to treat our bodies with respect and eat properly eat real food not junk food and coke to me and all those sugary drink- drinks are junk foods in new zealand in in where i lived in in the, in a place called nelson the number one cause for admission to the pediatric ward was rotten teeth from these sugary drinks and that's just appalling and and you know um what's it jamie oliver is on this huge campaign of of cutting these these rubbishy sugary drinks and and if, if so if somebody says, well, I don't have the the, the, the Coca Cola with sugar in, and then they have a spartamine. Like, you know, why would people eat food that's carcinogenic? Why why would people do that? And then wonder why they're getting sick. Well, um, it's a bit like um, people smoking. Yeah, it's got on the outside of the packet. Um, you know, smoking kills. It, it's it, there's a lot of psychology, isn't there, around around this. Um, it's not just about the addictive nature of those products. There's also significant other reasons why people become hooked in, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's the advertising and the marketing and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but, you know, that, and I think this brings us to how do we treat ourselves? How do we treat ourselves in other ways? So some people say that they treat themselves by listening to, to watching, by watching YouTube at night. And that's their treat because it calms them down. But, you know, we know that watching YouTube at night or watching the computer at night or watching the TV at night actually upsets your melatonin cycle and buzzes your mind out. So how do we find treats for ourselves? How do we find ways of soothing ourselves and relaxing ourselves that's healthy? How do we find drinks that are healthy that are good for us? How do we find food that's healthy that's good for us? And it's across the board. How do we look after ourselves in a way that honors our body and keeps us healthy as opposed to eating and consuming products that are guaranteed to make us sick? So why why do you think we stopped honoring our bodies? Why do you think we stopped using our intuition? Why do you think we stopped listening? Oh, I just think so many people are too busy. And, and, and the, the, you know, so I've just been on this pilgrimage. And <laughs> on this pilgrimage, people are taking time for contemplation. They're taking time to be still. And, and I think that's so much of what's happened in our society is that we're not taking the time. We're just keeping ourselves busy and revved up the whole time. So... So, you know, and one of the ways to start with with doing something different. I remember in my in my my medical practice, I Tony Robbins, that inspirational coach and speaker, Anthony Robbins, yeah, he he talks about your hour of power, having an hour to yourself every day. And I used to have people coming into my practice, and I'd say, How about this? How about having an hour to yourself every day when you do nothing? 
and you just lie in the, the hammock at the bottom of the garden and do nothing. Don't take your cell phone. Don't take anything down there. Just go to the bottom. They said, hour? How could I have? I'll even have five minutes. And I said, well, that is, that, that says it all, really. And I think at the time when I was the busiest in my life, when I was working crazy hours, I started doing, having this hour of power. And I would just do nothing. I'd go home, lie on my lounger and at lunchtime, and I would do nothing for a whole hour. And at first I thought, it's impossible. But the, the, the quality and my, and my efficiency at work doubled because of that one hour. And if I didn't have that one hour and I'd say, oh gosh, I've just got all this paperwork, I can't possibly do it. I would be there till seven at night, still struggling to finish everything. So yes, I think it's taking time for ourselves to stop and just be with ourselves and connect with ourselves. We've totally forgotten that, haven't we? We've, we're, we're surrounded with an environment that is just constant. And I think many of, many of us are finding it very hard to extricate ourselves in a way that is actually nurturing. But, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is the study of habit. What does it take to start a habit? And I've actually created um, a short video that I put on YouTube on how to create the habit of daily meditation. So what is it that we need to do to, have, to create a habit? And we need some sort of reward. So, and we need to do it about the same time every day. So... so <laughs> So to, to cleaning our teeth in, in the war, what was it, the First World War, the, nobody cleaned their teeth. And the biggest problem in, in the army was rotten teeth. And, and that was from lack of hygiene. Now it's due to sugar, but then lack of hygiene. And so the, the, the people who sold tooth powders, etc., and, and toothpaste would go door to door and they were laughed at, you know, who would, who would do that? So this guy approached a marketing specialist and he said, you know, will you sell my toothpaste? Anyway, he persuaded him to do it. And the guy realized that he needed to create this into a daily habit. So, and what does it take to create a daily habit? And those are the things that take to create a daily habit. Doing it about the same time every day, having some sort of reward. And those are essentially the main things. And so, for example, with my meditation, doing your meditation at about the same time every day and having some sort of reward. And uh, uh, that's right, there's another one. And that is making it achievable, not, not meditating for an hour or exercising for an hour, but exercising for 20 minutes every day, just walking around the block, not going up some great big mountain, but just walking around the block or walking in the park, making it achievable and doing it every day. It's the consistency. So how do we create a habit of going to bed relaxed? How do we create a habit of having a pre-bedtime relaxation routine? How do we create a habit of not watching so much TV and doing something relaxing in the evening, sitting listening to music, having some time for contemplation? How do we bring that into our lives? And I think the, the thing is, it's just about starting. It's about starting with those people that I worked with in my practice. I'd say start with five minutes every day and just do it about the same time every day. Start with 10 minutes. Start with 15 minutes. Start disciplining yourself just to leave the computer out of your bedroom. Make your bedroom into a relaxing, soothing place to be. Like just sit down, have a lovely chair in your bedroom and just sit down in that gorgeous chair and relax. Or go, go into bed and snuggle up in bed. You know, I was talking to one woman who had problems sleeping. She was going through a horrid divorce. And she left that marriage and got into her own home. And she said the first thing she did, she wasn't sleeping at all during that time, is that she created a beautiful bedroom, nurturing place for herself, and got some nice sheets and a lovely duvet and and, and, and she, she found going to bed at night just a very nurturing experience. And soon she was sleeping well. Huh. Yeah, amazing, hey? Yeah. Now tell, tell everybody about story time. Okay, okay. So what I did is I've 
trained in linguistics and I trained in hypnosis and I created all these guided relaxations, etc., as part of the program that I was doing. And I found for myself that they worked for a bit and then I got bored with them. And, and really, I don't want to do something that's a job when I go to bed at night. I don't want to listen to a guided relaxation every night because it's, it's, a, it's a job. It's something I have to do. Whereas I want to listen to something that I'm, that I'm looking forward to listening to. And so I created a story time. I recorded a book, um, and it's 53 chapters long, and I chose a, a, a children's story book called The Secret Garden. And so I, I read this story slowly and, and guide people into a slower brainwave pattern by listening to the story. And by listening to my voice and listening to the content of the story and getting engaged in the story, people say they, they find themselves slowing down their mind and going into a much deeper sleep. And I've had emails from all around the world from one woman who was going through chemo who tried everything. She tried whale music. She tried guided relaxation. She tried, a, she tried white noise. She tried Horlicks. And she found that is what enabled her to start sleeping well again by listening to a story every night. Because by listening to a story every night, it really encouraged her to do this pre-bedtime sleep relaxation routine. So I hopefully it will soon be for sale on iTunes, but at the moment it's on my website, thesleepkit.com. And, and I create a story time too, because some, some people find the, the secret garden a bit, a, a bit young for them, although I think it's an absolutely lovely metaphor for life. So I've created Storytime 2, which is a series of short stories, and that's for sale on the website as well, or some of them. It's not quite finished yet, the whole thing. Um, but it's stories by Oscar Wilde, like The Selfish Giant and The Happy Prince. <laughs> Caroline, it's been really fascinating. And really lovely to speak to you today. Um, just tell people how they find you so that they can actually follow up. Okay, so just go to thesleepkit.com, T-H-E, thesleepkit.com, and there's my website. And just contact me. There's contact details if people want to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. But otherwise, try story time. Thank you so much for joining me on Food for Thought. Thank you, Deborah.